since we're in a family setting, I, I thought I'd bring my family f album and share with you some of the examples we, we see on a daily basis. So uh, the first thing is you can't change what you can't measure. So we all agree on that, I hope. Uh, when you have fever, you use a thermometer. Uh, when you have high blood pressure, you take your, your high blood pressure measurement tool, I guess. Uh, so we like to measure things in real life, right? And uh, well, it should be the same for the internet and our infrastructure we either run or consume. So we need to measure to fix things. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what happens when you don't measure. And we had an amazing example over the last two years, which is with healthcare.gov. Uh, so obviously, unfortunately, they had some launch issues. Uh, but I think the worst part was the fact that they use CNN as their monitoring tool. Uh, <laughs> or if they couldn't catch CNN during the, the day, they had to wait on Saturday Night Live to figure out what they said about them. So you don't want to be uh, you know, talked about on CNN about your availability issues. Um, the other thing that is very important is um, great performance as we talk about today is not just about speed. It's not only about delivering your website in one second. I think it has to do also with availability, obviously. How consistently do you deliver that? Uh, and also reliability and integrity. So let me explain a little bit integrity. Um, when you order, let's say, a book on Amazon and you get a DVD, well, yeah, you, the website was fast and you know, the experience was pleasant, but at the end of the day, you didn't get what you paid for. So that's what I call integrity when it comes to measurement. So it is a great example of uh, Citibank, so I use them as a bank personally, and Saturday I had to go and pay some bills, and I tried to log in, and I was having a lot of issues. It just happens that I, I own a monitoring company, so that's kind of, uh, you know, cool, I guess. So I stick that in catch point, and then you know, a few minutes later, I get some data, and then it's like, huh, the Citibank without typing dub, dub, dub is really bad, but the Citibank when I type dub, dub, dub works really well. So there was a problem, so obviously I wrote a blog about it, and then suddenly it got fixed a few days later. So what was the, the issue? So their origin servers was in two separate uh, cities. One is in Houston, and the other one was, I think, in Dallas. And so the, that IP address, the 192 one, is in Houston, and it was not working, but half of the traffic was going there. <coughs> so when you don't monitor the right things, this is also what happens. Um, another one is, when we talk about measurements, and we had some great panelists earlier that were talking about like what's important for them, uh, you know, the front end, the back end, et cetera, it's very important that you try to put those two and two together. What is the performance of my front end? What is the performance of my back end? How do they correlate? So this is an example of measuring. Uh, so we have like 400 plus nodes around the world that we basically, uh, this is a, a Chrome test. So. Uh, the, this example is we go to Google and we search for a word and then Google is kind enough, they, let me get my laser thing, I've always wanted to use one of these things. So Google tells you that that particular query took 0 0.23 seconds. So what we end up doing in our tool is we can suck the, the performance data of how long it took to load the page, but also that particular time series that is um, uh, proprietary to Google and then we correlate the two. And as you can see, whenever we see spikes, like this, it wasn't the internet, it wasn't the nodes, whatever, it was actually the Google search response time that was taking a little bit longer. So you need to put in place mechanisms like these to be able to track how long it takes for the front end, but also for the back end. One of, the, one of my favorite topics these days is wireless, mobile. Uh, wireless, not Wi-Fi, right? Wireless as 4G, 3G, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is, again, uh, the Google search response time. I mean, obviously, they're spending a lot of money and effort on uh, talking about how important speed is for, for mobile, SEO, et cetera. And so this is uh, response time data, uh, web page response, so when was the page fully loaded, time to first byte and connect time. And this is by hour of the day. And this is in New York City, so the time series is uh, Eastern Standard Time. And uh, if lunch, I mean, good thing lunch was not heavy, so you guys are still a little bit awake, but oops, go back. 
Where's my laser thingy again? There you go. Nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. These are commuting times. And basically everything comes to a crawl. So you as a, an operator of a mobile website or any website and you have a lot of end users coming in from LTE devices in New York, whether it's AT&T or Verizon, by the way, this is a combination of both AT&T and Verizon, there is no difference. Well, at 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, your performance is going to suck and there is nothing you can do about it. Um, sorry. This is uh, the proof that what I just said is true. Uh, Memorial Weekend 2015, Memorial Weekend 2014. I wish every day we had performance like this, right? But I guess everybody's busy barbecuing, not using their mobile app or their mobile devices, and basically the wireless networks are not saturated. So this is one, one key thing that unfortunately we're all going to have to deal with is performance from the edge wireless network, again, 4G, 3G, et cetera, when the network is overly saturated and there is nothing we can do about it. This is a, a, another good one. Uh, I was trying to buy the Apple Watch when it came out, and I couldn't because I forgot to type dub 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 in front of apple.com. Very similar to the Citibank example, and actually we are, we're about to produce a blog about this. We analyzed the top 1,000 websites uh, based on Alexa, and 70% of those websites are using a different IP for dub 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 and non dub dub dub. So the dub 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 goes to a CDN. Akamai, Fastly, et cetera, et cetera. And typically people don't forget or it's very hard for them to configure the non-dub-dub-dub portion. So this example is Apple with and without www. Uh, so the www one goes to uh, uh, Akamai and it's fast. And the one that is not is very slow and actually really, really slow. We're talking about 3x slower. What a horrible user experience, right? Simple little change, mistakes. We shouldn't be doing these things. Um, again, the, the panelists talked a lot about um, you know, uh, how Fastly helped them, the, the immediate purge, et cetera, but also a lot of 503 errors that I think the lady from Wired was seeing. So this is not you, by the way. This is somebody else. Uh, but one of the things that uh, uh, we noticed was like, oh, my website got super fast. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, when you're delivering 100 bytes, yeah, your page is super fast. So be careful when you're using a CDN um, to make sure that you monitor not only the response time, but also what the heck was delivered. Because everybody can deliver great speed when you're delivering a one by one pixel. So just keep that in mind. And this, by the way, happens very often. Uh, this is uh, my, best, my best friend is robots.txt. So I use this a lot, and you know, again, going back to some of the earlier discussions we were talking about front end, back end, et cetera, uh, the origins. And so what we do a lot when we're troubleshooting a problem with, for our customers is we monitor the robots.txt file, for example, because that's usually your web servers. There is no database. There is no app layer. There is nothing. And we compare that to the dub, dub, dub portion of it. And as you can see, there is a pretty big difference and that difference is usually how long it takes for the other stuff to make the web page visible. And this is just on the time to first byte, by the way, the wait time. So robots.txt is a great, great friend. This we run in, into all the time. You know, it's his problem, no, it's your problem, it's my problem, etc. So origin versus non-origin. And one of the things I notice a lot is people, when they do monitoring, uh, whether internally, externally, et cetera, they don't spend time uh, or they don't think about monitoring their origin versus their, uh, their CDN version of their website. So, and here in this particular case, uh, we were monitoring this uh, customer of ours and we saw some issues. Um, the good thing is we were also monitoring their origin on a separate, on, for a separate engagement, and then we put the two and two together, and then you can see the origin was fine, but the CDN was having problems. So it's not always the origin that is having issues. CDNs have issues too, especially ones that don't use any cast. Anyway, uh, compression. 
So images, obviously, but one of the basic things that we still see a lot uh, is compression of texts. I mean, I think I've been talking to Steve Souders for the past eight years, and this is something every time I see him, I, 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 I can't believe we're still talking about this. There is all these FEO tools and this and that, and believe it or not, uh, the, the lack of compression of just the basic text assets, JavaScript, CSS, is, is a performance killer. So on the left, you have a, a, a this is actually a, a multi-step transaction. So on step one, the page is super optimized because it's the front page to that website. It's great, performance is fantastic. And then on the second page, we jump from like 1.6 seconds to about 11 seconds. I mean, that's a pretty big, uh, big uh, step. And uh, you know that's what happens when you're delivering like a bunch of uh, 200 kilobyte JavaScripts that are not compressed. And we're talking about like 20, 30 JS files, 50 CSS files, and they're all that size and not compressed. So compression, I think, is one of our, the enemy number one of web performance. And today, it just got worse because we're dealing with images and people putting 2.5 meg images that the marketing folks just pushed, and hey, it looked really good on my 5K iMac. Yes, not everybody has that. OK. This is another thing. When you look at your monitoring, please uh, just don't assume that you're putting some kind of front-end layer in front of it, that everything is going to be honky-dory on the origin. Uh, so basically, we were looking at the performance of a, of a customer, and then we saw these spikes, and then we said, what the heck was going on? And then we looked deeper a little bit because we have certain capabilities to do that. And anyway, we find out that server D, I mask, I renamed them, obviously, uh, for confidentiality reasons. So basically, server D that was in the pool was not behaving very well and was still getting a lot of traffic and making the website go really bad. Um, also, the Southwest did uh, a very good uh, promotion a few days ago, except that it took their website down. So uh, make sure that you insert yourself in some of the marketing things that are happening within your organizations, like be in the loop. So uh, yes, maybe the CDN can take the hit, obviously, of an increase in usage. But if you're not caching your, your pages to the edge and it's hitting back the origin, and you have three servers, and suddenly you go from like 100 hits a day to 10,000 hits a day, that's not going to work. So uh, literally, their, their entire website went kaput a few times for over a period of 48 hours. So speaking of airlines, uh, the, it's too bad the previous panelists were not here, but this is going to be a great segue. Uh, web pages uh, feel like a freaking airport with like 20,000 airplanes landing with no zero air controller these days. That's because of all the pixels that we're jamming into those pages, and it gets it's actually getting worse, not, not better. And now we're seeing more and more pixels also in the mobile websites, uh, which I didn't used to see last year, for example. It's like the flood. <laughs> the gates have been open. So actually, at Velocity a few months ago, not even a month ago, uh, I was about to get into a, uh, one of the conferences, and I had one of our customers chasing me. It's like, Maddie, we have a problem. And uh, what happened is actually a third-party pixel uh, company uh, decided to take down most of the websites. I mean, the Huffington Post was impacted. A bunch of other big websites were impacted. And what happened is like that, that third-party company, uh, so the, sorry, the impact was literally you would load a page, like let's say the Huffington Post, it will load, and then it will reload, and it will reload, and it will reload, and it will go on and on until my 16 gig of RAM on my laptop went kaput and I had to restart Chrome. Uh, so uh, what they did, sorry, uh, is they changed something in that third-party tag that had a function called location reload. A Jav so the JavaScript that they were delivering at the end would do a location reload, but instead of just that particular piece, they would reload the entire web page. That doesn't belong to them, by the way. So I'm about to finish, so let me go quickly. So some of the traps to avoid that we've seen is too much data. We live in a world where everybody's talking about big data. Uh, big data is really about connecting the dots, not just how much stuff you're, you're consuming, obviously. Um, Setting up the wrong goals when it comes to web performance, make sure that you have something that is achievable uh, is very important. Don't just put 
dashboards for the sake of dashboards, make sure that the dashboards are, mean something, that people can act on them. And again, Firewall's approach of just data. So we see that so much right now. We're just like, here is the data. Go and figure out where the needle is. So very important when you have a web performance initiative within your organization, set up the goals, make sure to figure out what you look at, what you collect, and how to look at the data. So I think that's it. I don't know if I have a few more minutes for questions, or we can do that later on.